Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. Boom, 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 boom. And all that jazz. It's a fantastic new comic book day, and there are a lot of exciting new comic books out this Wednesday, this new comic book day. However, um, it was really big. We were, The shipment got a little bit delayed at work. Um, lots of different stuff was going on. I re literally just finished reading 45 comics, and they are all exceptional. So I decided instead of working late into the night with an edit, with a video and all that stuff, I would just go ahead and do this live so that y'all can not have to wait so long for the weekly comic book review. And here it is. And as we always do, we start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, Mall number one. Mall number one from Vault Comics. You know that I absolutely love Vault Comics. I'm loving everything they do. They have an exceptional week this week. Fantastic books. Mall number one stood above everything else for me. Really like this one. It's written by Michael Morisi and Gary Doberman. It's got artwork by Zach Hartong, Addison Duke on the coloring, Jim Campbell on the lettering. Really like this one. It's kind of like the Warriors meets Dawn of the Dead without the zombies because we ourselves are the zombies, right? So it does definitely have that Warriors kind of vibe to it. Um, the artwork is gritty. It's raw. It's rough. A lot of people have already gotten a little bit of an early look at this one. Vault sent out some... Uh, uh, preview copy to some people not too long ago. Fantastic stuff. I really liked the mall. If you like Dawn of the Dead, if you like the Warriors, you like that post-apocalyptic type stuff, I think you're going to like this one. The basic idea is this. The apocalypse has happened. The end of the world has happened. And there's this last refuge of, of hope is the wrong word, but they're in a mall. So like this last bastion of humanity is holding out in this mall. And of course it gets fractured. There's all kinds of gangs and the gangs are like named after name brands and the, 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 the stores and stuff like that. Really fun, very imaginative. I really like it. It's violent, it's quirky, it's fun, and it's action-packed. Mall number one, pick of the week. There's also this variant cover from Vault Comics that's uh, like a Blade the Vampire Hunter. That's right. I love these homage covers they do, so that's really cool. Also from Vault Comics this week, we have Necromancer's Map. Necromancer's Map number one is the start of the second book of the Songs for the Dead line. So Songs for the Dead was a fantasy story about this necromancer and this uh, this quest that she has for the necromancer's map and all this kind of stuff, right? Really cool book. I really liked it. Came out from Vault a little bit ago. It's like four issues long, Songs for the Dead. This is the sequel, Necromancer's Map. So if you are trying to get into this because it's Vault, you may be a little bit lost right here um, checking this one out. I would highly encourage you to read Songs for the Dead first, but Necromancer's Map is really cool and I like it. If you like Songs for the Dead, there's no reason why you will not like that one, the exact same creative team. And there's a cool little homage cover they did to Elf Quest right there. Also from Vault, Sarah and the Royal Stars number two. I love this book. If you liked Sarah and the Royal Stars number one, you're going to love number two even more. Really builds out the world even more fully. Um, the characters get a little bit more realized. The artwork is great. I'm loving this book. It's got a nice Eastern and Western influence meshed together, and it works so, so well. Like I said, issue number two really takes the ideas from issue number one, and it really brings them out even more fully. It really builds out that world. It really builds out that lore and gets you a little bit more um, going as far as the momentum. It really starts picking up lots of really fun stuff. If you're a fan of high fantasy, I highly encourage you to check out Sarah and the Royal Stars. Resonant number two is out this week from Vault Comics. This book is just like Sarah in the Royal Stars number two, takes what was established in issue number one and just runs with it, picks up that pace, picks up that momentum, and it really just gets you right on through. D.B. Andre, um, Alejandro Aragon, Jason Wordy, and Darren Bennett. Jason Wordy's colors are absolutely fantastic, absolutely beautiful textures there on the artwork. I love it. It really, really amps up everything from the first issue. I loved the first issue, and issue number two was even better. Um, it's I said this before, it's like a comic book that really exercises the use of, of audio. Like, you can't hear a comic book, obviously, but with Resonant, it's almost like you can. It really amps up with that tension, with that suspense, and it's really, really fun. Survival horror type stuff like that. Resonant number two out this week, and I didn't, I was not lying when I said Vault's got a big week. Test number three is out this week from Christopher Sabella, Jen, uh, Jen Hickman, um, Harry Saxon, uh, Hassan Otman El Hal. <clears throat> Really love and test. This book is meaty. It's dense. It's got a lot of themes. It's got a lot of ideas. Um, it says a lot about like test marketing and this whole marketing culture that we live in right now where where sometimes you don't even realize that you've consented to basically be 
the 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 object of research, you know, in a way. There's a lot of stuff going on in here. Issue number three was really, really hardcore with the information. Lots of stuff to digest, but it still flows very fun. I'm loving this adventure. Um, I'm loving this quest. I'm loving these themes. I'm loving everything about Tess. This is something truly in the sense of something like Transmetropolitan or something like that. It's heavy, it's deep, it's got great, weird, cool sci-fi type stuff, and some interesting characterizations and a deepening mystery that I'm absolutely enthralled by. That's test number three. She Said Destroy number four is out. I just released an advanced review of this one yesterday. I'm loving this book. I love Liana Kangas' artwork. I think this is some of the best work I've seen from her so far. Joe Corallo doing a great job taking that that those themes and turning them on their heads Yet again, fleshing out those characters, making this very compelling. It's kind of like The Wicked and the Divine meets Star Wars, so it's like a fantasy sci-fi thing, and I'm having a blast with this one. The penultimate issue, number four, is out. If you want a little bit more of my thoughts on that, check out the advanced review. There was also an advanced review I did a while ago for The Mall, number one, the pick of the week, and definitely want to check that out. Also from Vault Comics, I was not lying. Cult classic return to Whisper double feature. This collects issue number two and the never released issue number three. So this was a five issue series that was going to kick off the cult classic, kind of like a shared universe of horror stories and mystery stories all surrounding this one town called Whisper, right? So this was the book that kind of launched it off. <clears throat> Only two issues came out. They did a second print of the first issue like a month ago. Now we got two and three back to back in one issue for only $3.99. Loving it. Fantastic stuff. Um, <clears throat> if you haven't been reading this one, it's basically about these kids that it's kind of like Goonies with a little bit of it kind of thrown in, but it's about these kids in this town of Whisper and they find this like hidden treasure, right? And now 15 years later or whatever, terrible things are happening to them and it's just crazy. I'm loving it so much. So much. Elliot Ray Hall is the uh, writer of this one. He's got his second cult classic book coming out soon, Creature Features. So this is a great chance with the second printing of number one that came out last month and this double feature right here which collects number two which has already been released but also issue number three which hasn't. So if you've been keeping up with the story, <clears throat> it's kind of necessary but it's really, really fun. It was nice to revisit. Also, the second Heathen Trade Paperback is out this week. And so you, if you're excited like I am, I can finally get caught up on Heathen. So I'm very excited. Let's jump over to Marvel. Marvel Comics 1000. So let's talk about this. I thought this idea was going to be kind of stupid. I thought it was going to be kind of dumb. So <clears throat> Action Comics 1000 came out. DC had success. They also had success with Detective Comics 1000. Now, those were stories and, and books that actually legitimately got that far, right? Where does Marvel Comics 1000 come from, aside from just trying to ride on the coattails of that kind of an idea of that kind of success, right? <clears throat> So I wasn't really that down for it. Basically, the idea is it's 80 pages celebrating 80 years of Marvel history, and each page is going to be done by a different creative team, right? Some of Marvel's most famous creators from its past are, are kind of coming back to, for the celebration, right? Well, I've read it, and it was awesome. I really, really enjoyed Marvel Comics 1000. I, w I came in with the lowest of, of expectations. I just thought it would be a bunch of random one-page stories that were kind of cute and silly, and there are those in there. But this is actually a very well-done celebration of 80 years of Marvel history. There is a story and a mystery that's developed in here by writer Al Ewing, by the way, that builds up throughout the entire history of Marvel Comics and it really erupts and it takes all these different ideas and these different threads from Marvel's history and they and it ties it together in a really, really cool way. Really like this one. Thought it was really neat. So you got a bunch of different creative teams, but like I said, Al Ewing is kind of spearheading this mystery that's kind of thread throughout it. Lots of fun stuff. And one of the interesting things about the way that they tell this story is that each page represents in a way, sometimes just thematically, um, a, a year in the history, <clears throat> excuse me, of Marvel Comics. So I think it's really, really cool for that. Like the first page deals with a little bit about the Human Torch and it goes on, so forth and so from there, right? My favorite page, if you want to know, is the one about Blade. Blade Week, that's my favorite. But Marvel Comics 1000, yeah, it may be a cash grab, but I thought it was actually more of a great celebration of the history of Marvel Comics than Action Comics was for Superman or Detective was for Batman. Like, they were, those were nice. They had some nice little fun stories. <clears throat> 
But aside from just the fun little stories that are in here, the way it's all tied together, I'm very intrigued by this mystery, and now I'm excited to check out that Marvel Comics 1001. House of X number three is out this week, so out of all the craziness that's been going on in Hickman's book, this almost feels like a tame issue, but not really, because now all this world re rebuilding, I should say, has been done. Now it just kicks off into full gear X-Men action mode here in House of X number three. We've got the players. We've got the different things. We've got all the explanations. We've got all the different crazy timelines and everything. Hickman's really creating something truly special and reverent with the X-Men history in the pages of House of X and Powers of Ten. I'm loving it. The artwork by Pepe Larraz is absolutely fantastic. It's spectacular uncanny even but i really like this one a lot of people are responding very well to hickman's take on the x-men i'm loving it house of x number three is not gonna let you down it's really really fun absolute carnage number two is out this week another absolute fun and insane and crazy punk rock metal type book this book is balls to the wall if you liked issue number one you're gonna love issue number two it's not quite as big right? So it's not $7.99, but it is $4.99, but you do get some extra pages. Great artwork by Ryan Stegman and a really cool story. I'm loving everything that Donny Cates has been doing, building up this world of Venom, tackling the themes, having some really fun, cool moments, coming up with new powers and things like that. Absolute Carnage is an absolute blast. I'm loving it. It's dark. It's it's crazy. I love the way that Donny Cates writes Cletus Cassidy. Some really fun things happen in this issue, and there are some fun tie-ins out this week as well. Venom number 17 is out. <clears throat> First of all, this book does kind of focus in on Eddie's kid, <clears throat> excuse me, and little Normie, and uh, the maker. So that's really cool. There are things that happen in the pages of Absolute Carnage number two that directly tie into things that are being done in here. So they... they all these tie-ins today kind of happen at the same time, and I really like that the way they kind of do that. They really flow very, very well. I would highly encourage you, though, to read how uh, Absolute Carnage <clears throat> number two before you check out some of the tie-ins. But Venom number 17, is it ultimately necessary? Mm, maybe not, but it's really fun and fleshes out a lot more about what's going on Um auxiliary to the main story the absolute carnage lethal protectors is here that's a really cool variant cover i love by greg smallwood um this book focuses in on the john jameson stuff on the misty knight stuff and it actually introduces the new demigoblin and everybody's kind of curious about the the design variant that we had for absolute carnage number one we're like whoa the demigoblin's uh, a woman now how does that happen well it gets explained and it makes so much sense and i really like it i'm like really down for it i think it's pretty rad actually so first appearance of that character is in here and i think a cameo in absolute carnage absolute carnage miles morales number one is out today um so in absolute carnage number two there's gonna be a scene with miles and scorpion it all starts here and then it erupts into some craziness that's all covered in absolute carnage number two but this is a fun um way to look at how that initial um, interaction with Scorpion and Miles worked. Um, this is fun. It's vibrant. It's written by Saladin Ahmed, but it doesn't quite have the feel of his typical Miles book. This one feels a lot more free, a lot more loose, a lot more just heavy metal. And it's really fun. And I'm so far enjoying all of these tie-ins for Absolute Carnage. I am just enjoying the heck out of them. Also, check this out. Amazing Spider-Man 300 is a reprint in 3D. That's out this week. That's super cool. You might want to check that out. Fantastic Four for Yancey Street. It's a one-shot comic, I think. It's got artwork by a bunch of different people. Greg Smallwood's bits are really, really cool. The Mark Bagley stuff feels a little bit rushed. Some of the artists, other artists feel just a little bit rushed. The coloring's kind of a little off throughout it, at least for me. The story, though, a really cool, fun little story. It's written by Gary Duggan. Um, it's, if you're a Fantastic Four fan, this feels classic. It deals with the, the, the ramifications of them now existing in a new headquarters uh, uh, in the thing's old haunts, um, Yancey Street, in fact, for Yancey Street being the address. I'm a big Fantastic Four fan. Stuff like this is really, really fun. The art does switch up. It does get inconsistent, and that's kind of a downfall of this book, but the story itself is pretty cool. Monsters. So Marvel's been celebrating 80 years with a whole bunch of one-shots this year. That's basically what this one is. It's got Kid Kaiju in it, so if you've been following that story, if you want more of that, you're going to check it out. But it also just has a whole giant, the whole, the majority of this book, actually, is just these awesome like like splash pages of all the different monsters from Marvel's past, especially the 50s and stuff like that. And they're beautiful and they're awesome. So it's mostly a pinup book, but it's still pretty fun. I thought it was pretty neat. Amazing Spider-Man 28 is here. It wraps up this whole new syndicate um, storyline. I've really been enjoying this one. I love Boomerang being Peter Parker's 
roommate. That's been really, really fun. Um, I'm loving the quirkiness of this. After the, the long, depressed run of The Hunted, I'm really excited to get back to something a little bit more fun, a little bit more lighthearted. And that's exactly what this Spider-Man book has been, even though still teasing some things about what's going on exactly with Boomerang. But I'm loving Boomerang and Spidey being roommates. I'm loving the, uh, the hijinks that ensue because of it. So Amazing Spider-Man number 28 is out today. Spider-Man Life Story number 6. This is the final issue of Chip Zdarsky and Mark Bagley's look at what it would be like if Spider-Man started in 1961 as a 15-year-old 15, 15 kid or 62, and continued on today and aged in real time. So this is the final bit. Um, really cool stuff. It deals a little bit with Miles. It deals a little bit with Octavius. It deals just like the previous issues with some of the main themes and the main drives plot-wise of the Spider-Man stories of that decade. So this has been a really fun book. It's really cool because as comic book fans all the time, we're always like, what would it be like if they would age in real life? Like, what if this all happened in real time? Well, this is the story that Chip Zdarsky's given it, and he's given it very well. It's great. It's well-written. I love the artwork. I love everything about this. And it's over. It's going to be sad to see it end, but I would love to see Marvel do some more um, mini series of like other characters, like what it would be like if they aged, like the Fantastic Four or the Hulk or, or something like that. It'd be really, really, really cool. Thor number is this 16? Yes. Thor number 16 is out this week. This is Jason Aaron's final issue of Thor. It's going to be continuing. His final story is going to be King Thor. But this is a big final farewell send-off, still wrapping up from the War of the Realms. It's an all right issue. It's a nice kind of capstone to what Jason Aaron's been doing for, what, like six, seven years on the Thor books. I'm loving his Thor run. I think it stands as one of the best Thor runs of all time, right up there with Walt Simonson and Jack Kirby. I'm really loving it. Um, it's a nice little capstone. It's a nice little epilogue to everything. Thing, but there's nothing super new or super exciting, but there is some interesting things that happen at the end that lead into the King uh, Thor story coming up. Speaking of Jason Aaron writing Thor and Thor Adventures, here's Avengers number 23. Really liking this story, liking the spotlight on Ghost Rider, Robbie Reyes, um, Johnny Blaze in hell, um, racing for the Ghost Rider for the Spirit of Vengeance. It's fun. You get some explanation about what the Spirit of Vengeance is. Just a little bit, just a smidgen. Blade's still super cool. And that little baby man thing he's got, the boy thing, it's adorable. I love it so much. Anyway, Avengers number 23 is out this week, and I really, really liked it. General Hux has his own Age of Resistance one-shot from Star Wars. That's right. These Age of Resistance, Age of Rebellion, Age of Republic one-shots have been pretty neat. This General Hux one, I wasn't really looking that much forward to it. I just thought this character was kind of... I mean, I don't know. He's an all right character, I guess, in those movies. But this issue was actually really, really cool. Deals a little bit with his relationship, if you want to call it that, with Kylo Ren. Some interesting stuff about his motivations, who he actually is, where he comes from. So that stuff is kind of interesting and new to me. Poe Dameron is another Age of Resistance one-shot out. This explains a little bit about how Poe decided to join the Resistance. So it was a nice little fun story. Tom Taylor did a great job with both of those. Let's jump on over do, 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 to DC. Batman Superman number one is out this week. So this is one of the covers. The other cover has Superman on it. And then there's a third cover that's got them both on it, right? Um, if you were following the storyline about the Batman who laughs, you definitely want to be reading this one. This one is his next story, his next what he's doing. If you've been seeing all these ads about who are the infected and all that kind of stuff. This is where that story's going. It's written by Joshua Williamson. It's got artwork by David Marquez. So it's really cool to see David Marquez over at DC doing some cool stuff. Um, I really liked this issue. I thought it was cool. It's not going to change your life you know it's not the best batman superman book i've ever read but i am incredibly interested in what the batman who laughs is doing in the dc universe what his plans are all of that jazz so i really liked it thought it was cool liked uh, marquez's artwork love sanchez's coloring i thought it was really cool justice league number 30 though was great this is the start of the justice doom war and it starts off with a hell of a bang Really, really loving what Scott Snyder, James Tiny, and N Company are doing. We got Jorge Jimenez back on the artwork. It's 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 great. It's energetic. It's highly kinetic. It's charged. It leaps off the page. It does people like Kirby and Bashima and Ramita proud. Fantastic stuff. I'm loving Justice League right now. This has been a big epic story, and it's finally building up to the ultimate peak, right? And they're having so, so much fun with it. And you can tell, and I'm having so much fun reading it. Like I said, this is the official start of the Justice Doom War the big finale what they've all been building up to and it was just fantastic i love the hell out of this one there's a lot of explaining in there 
but the explaining is done very, very well. Justice League Dark number 14 is out, and you can definitely feel that James Tynion's gearing up to his endgame in these pages. I'm really liking it. The ultimate villain revealed. What's going on? How's it affecting things? Really like this issue. Um, love the artwork. Love those double-page spreads. Tiny is doing a great job with this book, and he's also doing the Just League. So him and Scott Snyder, the architects of two major big things happening right now in the Justice League books. But if you've been liking Justice League Dark, no reason why you're not going to like this issue. It's fantastic. It's awesome. Batman, Curse of the White Knight number two is out. So if you like the White Knight, no reason you won't like this one. I really liked it. This one is really, really heavy on the exposition. It gets a little verbose. It kind of it kind of affects the flow of the story just a little bit for me. But I do like this interpretation interpretation of Azrael. I like this this conflict that's being slowly built up between him and Batman and then it just kind of explodes. Some big things do happen in this issue as far as this world goes. I love Sean Murphy's artwork. I think it's fantastic. He had in Hollingsworth colors and it's cool. It's just a beautiful thing to look at. This issue though just a little bit slowed down because of the uh, the verbose exposition. So Superman 14 is finally here. And it doesn't look like they changed too much from the inside. So maybe the story about it just being the cover that they changed is the truth. I don't know. I'll tell you what, though. The pages of Superman have been a little bit boring for me right now. I think Bendis has been dragging this Regal Czar thing or what, whatever his name is out way too long. His promises on the cover to be the final fate. I doubt that. I doubt that. But... This does, as we all have been anticipating, lead back to the reintroduction of the Legion of Superheroes. So that's really, really cool. If you're a Legion fan, you definitely want to check it out for that. And it just feels like Bendis just doesn't want to write Jonathan. Not in the pages of Superman. Also, in the pages of Justice League, another team returns. I think it's kind of everybody knows what I'm talking about, but it's a great moment in that story. And there's some uh, there's a Kirby character that reappears. That's awesome. That's all I'm saying. Action Comics 1014 is out this week. This book's been a little bit better than Superman for me a little bit lately. Um, this one's got some interesting bits, knowing about the new owner of the Daily Planet, um, having her interact with some of the, the staff members of the Daily Planet. That's really fun. Then it gets back to this Thorn Red Cloud stuff, and it just completely bores me. I don't know. I'm not really completely sold right now. On the, on the Superman books by Bendis, but at the end of here, I got kind of excited, so that was neat. Detective Comics 1010. Um, this is a fun little Deadshot story. It's pretty neat. You know that old idea about you know, two soldiers from World War II, one Japanese soldier, one American soldier, and, you know, they could crash on one of those islands and they would never know the war ended. Well, it's kind of like that version of the story, but then you add in Batman and Deadshot and a whole plane full of uh, survivors of a plane crash, or a plane full of survivors from a plane crash. Well, that kind of says itself, doesn't it? Anyway, I really liked this story. I thought it was pretty cool. Still slowly building up this Mr. Free stuff, very, very, very slowly, but I am liking this book, and it's kind of fun. Flash, number 77. Man, I'm loving Flash right now. Flash has been a little up and down at times. Sometimes a storyline can go out a little bit too long. Sometimes it can drag down just a little bit. However, Flash, number 77, this new story, the death of the sp or death in the Speed Force, what is, this? what is it exactly called? Death and the Speed Force. Really liking it. Some old school villains coming back, and that's always fun. You got the Year of the Villain tie-in, including the Rogues, and that's always fun. Joshua Williamson, though, has been... Doing a good job on Flash since Rebirth started. 77 issues in, and I'm still liking it. I'm still engaged, and that's really, really cool. Freedom Fighters number 8 is out this week. I'm loving this book. It's a 12-issue miniseries. It's written by Robert Vendetti, right? Yeah. Eddie Barrow's back on the artwork in here. Very explosive, very dynamic in the artwork. This is the secret origin of Black Condor, and I'm really liking it. Loving this book. It's set in a world where the Nazis won World War II, and now a band of superheroes have to try to free America from Nazi a rule. It's pretty cool. Dial H for hero number six. This was supposed to be the final issue, but it's not. It's actually going to continue for a little bit longer, and it better because of the ending on here. This book has been so much fun. You got Joe Quinones doing a whole bunch of different artistic styles, a lot of tributes, a lot of homages, all these different heroes that he gets to create. Sam Humphrey's doing a great job with the script, great job with the characters. I like this conclusion to this initial arc, and I like this setup for what's to come. Puts a real interesting spin on the lore and mythology of the Dial H. Also from DC this week we got a house of secrets 92 reprint facsimile edition this is the first appearance of swamp thing so if you've never read it always wanted to check it out there you go it's perfect for you right we got some new indie books let's talk about them tommy gun wizards from dark horse comics this one is basically like the untouchables but instead of going after al capone for for illegal booze and booze being prohibited it's magic right so that's basically what it is it's the untouchables 
but with magic instead of booze. And it's it works. It works so well. It's written by Christian Ward, who usually we just know as an artist, but the writing is really spot on. I really like it. Sammy Cavella doing the art. Oh, the artwork is great. It's noirish. Um, it's stark and it's it's just it's so clean and beautiful. This is the cat that um that drew Abbott from Boom Studios last year with Solid and Ahmed. Love the art in that book. Love the art in this one. Like I said, it's the Untouchables with magic, and I really like it. It really feels like it's set in the time zone that it's set. You got Al Capone in it. You got Elliot Ness in it, and you got this whole spin of magic, and it's a really interesting take on the story. I really liked it. Tommy Gun Wizards, number one out this week. Be on the lookout for that from Dark Horse. Also from Dark Horse, we got Manor Black number two. Manor Black number two takes what was established in issue number one, which was creepy, moody atmosphere, interesting um, characters, a mystery, what's going on, and it takes it and it just keeps it going and it keeps it going full steam. Absolutely love it. Tyler Crook's artwork is some of the best horror artwork in comics today. I love it. I could look at pages of this just over and over and over again. It's got this beautiful like ink wash watercolor thing. Cullen Bunn, Brian Hurt doing a great job with the story. Like I said, an interesting mystery, interesting characters. So much fun. I'm loving it. Manor Black number two did not disappoint. I loved it so much. We got a new issue of Ice Cream Man. That's always a treat. Ice Cream Man number 14. This is kind of a horror anthology in a way. Not quite a horror book at all times, but it's very unsettling, unnerving. Um, it's bittersweet. This is one of those stories that has like a tinge of hope, a tinge of sweetness, but then this, this sourness underneath it. Ice Cream Man continues to be one of the most imaginative, one of the most innovative comics out there. And this is another supremely innovative comic book from Ice Cream Man, um, from writer W. Maxwell Prince, right? Yes. And Martin Morazzo on the artwork, Chris O'Halloran on the coloring. Everything about this sickly sweet book, it just resonates with me. I love it. It makes you feel uneasy, like I said, but it also makes you feel hopeful. And this is one of those great issues where they take that dichotomy and it really works and it works so well. And you kind of get it all themed together through theme and layout with a crossword puzzle. <laughs> that book's awesome. It needs a win in Eisner and it needs it soon. Ascender number five is out this week. Um, I'm loving Ascender. Um, I loved Descender. And Ascender's really fun, and it takes Descender, and it kind of goes a few years into the future, and it's more fantasy, magic-based, aside from just science and technology, right? Um, and I'm loving it. This book hits a real sharp turn all of a sudden, right? Um, it's filled with heart. It's filled with adventure. It's filled with beautiful artwork by Dustin Wynn, Jeff Lemire, doing a great job building this world up, rebuilding this world, completely different than what we knew from Descender, but it still feels the same, and I love it for that. And like I said, this issue, major turn in the story, major, major turn in the story. From IDW this week, we have Mountainhead number one. This is a new one from John Lee and Ryan Lees. Really, really like this book. I did an advanced review of this one like a month or two ago. Um, check out that video for a little bit more of my thoughts, but I can't really spoil too much about it. But basically, it's about this father and his son. They live off the grid and they survive by going across the country and burglarizing houses, right? He's got this kid like brainwashed, thinking all this crazy stuff, conspiracy theories and whatnot. And then the story just takes a twist and a turn and another one and then a loop-de-loop -loop and it doesn't end up where you think it's going to go, but it ends up somewhere very fantastic, very cool and very unnerving and a little chilling. I really liked Mountainhead number one, a great debut. Love the artwork. It's angular. It's gritty. It's, it's in your face. It's dynamic. This is a violent book. It's a bloody book. It's a gruesome book. It's a real book. It's also a silly book at times when it wants to be. Mountainhead, there's a lot more going on here than what it seems. Star Pig number two is out this week from IDW. So this is the story about like the last survivor of a spaceship um she gets saved by this giant mega tardigrade out in space and then this like the collector type like a collector type being tries to take her or whatever right i'm loving this book it's got bright vibrant colors kind of little lisa frankish um it's intended to be that way really did like this one um it's humorous it's fun it's got a nice fun brisk pace to it and it's just a joy and a pleasure to check out from valiant this week we got dr mirage number one this is a new launch of dr mirage it's written by magdalene visaggio nick robles on the artwork with george Belair on the coloring. Really did like this one. Um, I'm not that familiar with Dr. Mirage. I think this is a new character. I don't know if it's tied into an old character, but this is a really cool story. Some really neat, 
crazy ideas, some psychedelic type stuff to it. Really did like it. This is some of Visaggio's best stuff, like the the themes that she tackles, um, the works that I love the best out of her, like Eternity Girl and stuff like that. I totally pick up a lot more out of this. Um, really, really fun. I really liked it. Dr. Mirage, number one, out this week. Killers, number two, is out from Valiant this week. I really did like issue number one. It was a nice, big, fun action fest, just crazy action movie. Issue number two is pretty much the same thing. Um, all the different killers in the ninja program, all the different assassins. So Ninjak, we found have found out, is actually Ninja K. So in this one, you get to meet a lot of the others. Ninja J, Ninja I. I don't know if those are the ones you actually... I don't remember the actual names, but it's been pretty fun, and I'm liking it, and Valiant's doing some good stuff right now. From Boom, we've got Mighty Morph and Power Rangers 42. First of all, look at that cool foil pink ranger cover. I'm loving it starting in season two of Power Rangers when Jason Trini and Zach leave and Rocky and Adam and Aisha come in and you got Tommy becoming the White Ranger if you're a Power Rangers fan this fills in those gaps it adds new layers and dimensions to the characters to the story to the mythology and the lore this has been the best Power Ranger books we'll ever get and Ryan Parrott's the reason for also really cool artwork i'm loving what's going on in the power rangers book right now we got a couple buffy books out this week buffy the vampire slayer chosen ones it's a 7.99 one shot with three different stories about three different slayers so if you're a buffy fan and you're enjoying this new reboot of buffy in the modern day in comic books this is going to share shed a little bit more information about some of the other slayers and that's something that we're used to and it's always something that's fun when they go back and visit some of the lives and adventures of the previous slayers but it also does one story the main story that ties in a lot to the Hellmouth and what exactly is going to be erupting in the pages of Buffy and Angel in the next coming months. Angel, speaking of Angel, Angel number four is out this week. I'm liking what Brian Hill's doing right now. He's doing he does a great job with these lonely brooding LA type characters, right? Um, Angel number four is a joy. I'm loving it. I'm loving this whole Buffy ver universe reboot. Sometimes I think they're trying to throw too much out there too soon. But I mean, do you really going to try to take four years to develop everything in a comic book? I mean, I know, but you know, it happens in a TV show. You have that luxury sometimes, but they are throwing a little bit too much in there, I think. But I am enjoying it. So the final issue so far of Mary Shelley Monster Hunter, number five, it's out this week. I'm loving this one so much. It's got artwork by Hayden Sherman, one of my favorite artists in the biz right now. He's also doing Wasted Space. He's doing Thumbs. Just a fantastic artist. Um, I love this reinterpretation of the events of the Frankenstein novel as if they were actually happening to Mary Shelley, but just slightly differently. Um, I love those differences. I love this book. The other night, I just reread issues one through four in preparation for issue number five. Um, it is a definitive of ending but it also sets up the possibility of returning i haven't heard anything officially about this book returning but i really want this book to return dark arc's coming back so why not mary shelley monster hunter i love that book and hayden sherman Anything that cat draws, I'll buy. Also from Aftershock, we've got Knight's Temporal number two. So when issue number one came out, I said that I did like it, but it feels like you had to read solicitations or kind of think a little bit to get exactly what was going on. And maybe it was weak as a first issue for that. And maybe issue number two would definitely be bringing that back, right? And would definitely like be more of a like a fire driver's seat kind of issue. Uh, yeah, absolutely. A lot is explained in issue number two that you didn't quite maybe get in issue number one. Really cool story. Interesting takes on it and an ending to it that I really like. Cullen Bunn's doing some solid work right now. Knights Temporal and Manor Black both out this week. And... Finally, from Scout Comics, let's talk about Headless. Headless number one. Um, I think some shops got this last week. We didn't get it until this week. I read it. I liked it. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, it's about these kids in the 80s, so you got all that kind of stuff. But what I really liked about it was the artwork. The artwork is super, super cool. And it's got this like monochromatic type thing to it. Well, not really monochromatic because there's two colors. There's the pink. There's the blue. Just like in the colors. Um, I love the art. Um, the story is really interesting. The characters are interesting. It's basically about a town where the headless horseman is there. And there's this like... Was he a sheriff or was he a, he was a sheriff and they're like there to like, they're part of the, they're part of like an organization that's always been there to protect this town from the headless horseman or something. I don't know. It's got some cool, um, interesting mystery. Um, it's really neat. I do like the colors. I like that indie style to it. It does get a little verbose at times. Um, it's a dense story. There's a lot going on per page and sometimes it slows down the flow of it a little bit. Um, especially when I just want to kind of look at the art. And like I said, I just, absolutely love the artwork in this one. I love the use of color. So that's what I read this week. That's what I thought about it. Um, sorry about the live stream. I hope you guys didn't mind, but I didn't want you to wait 
too long for the video tonight because that was a lot of books. Lots of excitement in comic shops tomorrow. So thank you guys and gals and everyone else so much for checking out the video. Please do like, share, and subscribe. Let us know in the comments down below what you're reading, what you're excited about, and all that jazz. Please do like, share, and subscribe. And check us out at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts and a whole lot more. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.